Alright, I'm gonna keep this brief so you can get to the video as fast as possible. This was originally uploaded back in September of last year, and in January it was taken down by the lovely people who own the rights to Haruhi. They ignored my email reaching out to find a compromise for three months, and today their strike expired, bringing the status of this channel back to normal. I'm really proud of this video, so now that I'm free, I refuse to let it stay dead forever. I've made a couple of alterations and added some desaturation to the video because that's what's worked for creators much larger than I am in the past. Here's hoping this is transformative enough. Keep in mind that there are spoilers ahead, and that's all for me. Enjoy the video. Do you think it's possible to anticipate how important an event will be for you later down the line as it's happening? Well, in the case of the direction my videos are taking, I definitely didn't expect any of this. Because what started out as me just humoring my brother by watching 30 gallons of tea go down the drain has since evolved into a brutal realization. I think I like anime. I've been watching a ton of shows every evening for a couple of months now, and out of every studio whose work was displayed in front of me, it wasn't hard at all for me to pick my favorite. Kyoto animation is a very special group of people who make very special stories come to life in their own wonderful way, and I've been working my way through as many as I can as quickly as possible. Amagi Brilliant Park, Love Chunibyo and Other Delusions, Hioka, Kaon, A Silent Voice, Tamako Market, Canon, and Clanad, which I intend to start as soon as I'm finished with the game. If the two are anything alike though, it's safe to say I should look forward to a masterpiece. I can't say I enjoyed everything I've seen by them, I'm not much of a fan of their pure comedy comedies aside from Brilliant Park, but I still have a lot of respect for them. The shows I do enjoy, however, are the ones that gave me the deep appreciation for this art form that I have now. Most of their shows convey grounded stories through the lens of everyday life that anyone can watch, enjoy, and most of all, get something important out of. Their whimsical charm never fails to brighten the mood, while their emotional gut punches never fail to ruin your day in the best kind of way. Every frame of their works oozes the unprecedented passion they have for animals. Anime. When I saw a silent voice for the first time, I couldn't believe that a group of people actually drew this. And the reason for their unbelievably high bar for quality is the work environment they foster. Kyoto Animation is the brightest beacon of hope for an industry plagued by unethical working conditions. Full salaries to every employee, benefits such as maternity leave, and financing projects themselves so they can encourage their workers to take the time they need to do the best job they can. All three of these things seem like they should be common place in the industry, but they're not. This, in combination with their heartfelt storytelling, has earned them the reputation of being the loving, almost motherly figure for the anime community. And with all that being said, what the hell was the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya? Seriously, I want an answer. Shout out loud if you have to. I won't hear it, but maybe. Maybe, just... I don't know, I just want to understand. Line up all of the KyoAni shows together, and you'll notice uniformity in their wholesome scripts and charming scenery. And then you'll find Haruhi, sitting in the corner and snorting glitter. I've seen this show several times now, sometimes with friends, and their opinions on it are... Entertaining. Can you briefly tell me what you think about Haruhi? Uh, Haruhi is the worst piece of shit anime I have ever seen in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And it was a mistake watching it with you, because you're the worst piece of shit person I've ever met in, in my entire life. Yeah, but why do you feel that way? Um, because if... Cut. Cut? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, this is live, sir. What are you doing? <laughs> This show is about an apathetic high schooler named Kion, whose life is flipped upside down when he meets Haruhi Suzumiya, an over-the-top crazy person who only cares about things that are interesting to her, such as aliens, time travelers, and espers. Kion strikes up conversations with her on a whim, which give her the idea to form a club of her own after growing discontent with all the currently existing ones at school. And thus, the SOS Brigade was born, but it needs some more members. So we've got Yuki Nagato, an emotionless bookworm who just so happens to be an alien, Mikaru Asahina, a cutesy crybaby who just so happens to be a time traveler, and Itsuki Koizumi, the coolest guy in town and my personal hero, who just so happens to be an esper. From there, all kinds of supernatural happenings threaten to destroy Kion's normal high school life, and the cause of all of them always seems to be Haruhi. I know that doesn't sound too out there, but the oddities of Haruhi show themselves the minute you delve deeper than what can be found on the back of the box. Today, we're going to explore this show together, and by the end of it, Hopefully I'll have an answer for why I walked away from the show feeling the way I did. Alright, so... Ugh. 
Just starting to watch this show is a headache. Turns out there are roughly four different official ways you can watch Haruhi, because the original season in 2006 was broadcasted out of order and it's been shuffled around a few times ever since. They did this to give season one a proper climax, which they wouldn't have been able to do if they ended with the episode that appears last in the timeline. Unfortunately, watching the show in this original order is pretty awful. I genuinely can't understand why someone would prefer watching this show out of order instead of chronologically. Haruhi focuses a lot on why characters are doing the things they're doing rather than explaining what they're doing, which really works in its favor. But leaving the viewers scratching their heads for 5 minutes at the start of each episode because they're trying to figure out where and when they are muddies up what they should really be focusing on. Plus the broadcast order puts one of my favorite episodes first even though it's the perfect payoff for the 5 season 2 episodes that come before it chronologically. The fact that people have watched this as their introduction to Haruhi with no build up or context makes me really sad. So just watch it chronologically, right? No harm no foul if the old orders are outdated. Well, more or less. There are some weird moments that can't be ignored. Episode 6 is definitely structured like a season finale, and afterwards everyone downplays its events by just going back to business as usual, which really threw me for a loop my first time watching. Imagine for a second how frustrating it would be to listen to someone bounce between topics as if they had never started talking in the first place. That's how watching season one can feel sometimes, and it's why the aesthetics lend themselves tremendously to the show. Every location is brought to life by Kyoto Animation's impeccable eye for detail. If something changes in a room, it's going to stay changed, allowing you to see places like the club room evolve as time goes on. Mikuru's costumes, the Tanabata tree, the whiteboard, baseball equipment, tea sets, Nagato's books. All of this stuff is added and moved around as time goes on, and every recurring location is the same way. Also, while it wasn't the doing of KyoAni themselves, it's worth mentioning that the English dub for this show is fantastic. All five brigade members are voiced by talented, recognizable voice actors, which as you may know, isn't usually the case for anime. Where were you? I thought you'd be back. I was waiting and didn't even eat lunch. Could you say that again, but like you're an old friend who's embarrassed and only acting angry? Stop being an idiot and come with me right now! Stuff like this is fun to appreciate, but what elevates the aesthetics into a key strength of the show is how they're used to convey emotion. No Nobody in the SOS Brigade is willing to directly say what they're thinking. Haruhi is too insecure, Nagato and Mikuru aren't allowed to, Koizumi is way too shady, and even Kion is an unreliable narrator with his constant snark. Because there are so many walls between the group, the animation can truly shine by showing the audience what they're thinking through body language. Facial expressions and small movements tend to shine a light on whatever these five are doing a really bad job at hiding. When Haruhi is being dragged away from the world she unknowingly created, by Kion, you can see the desperation she hides behind her smile as she tries to convince him that this world is better than the one they left behind. There are examples of this in every episode, and it's a sign of great direction by a team of people who truly care. Go figure. Emotions are very show-don't-tell, and the script itself properly conceals the subtext without resorting to the stupid-ass pronoun game or making every character talk in weird haikus. I missed so much my first time watching through. For example, I always thought it was weird how Haruhi ended up perfectly casting each brigade member into their supernatural roles for her movie, until just the other day when I learned she based it off of when Kion tried to tell her their true identities. Which not only says a lot about how Haruhi views Kion, but also how stupid I am for not noticing. It's stuff like this that makes rewatching this show so enjoyable for me, and also for the love of god, listening to characters lecture about sci-fi nonsense drives me insane. I don't know about you guys, but I've noticed a disturbingly high amount of the shows I've watched with supernatural elements try to explain their phenomena with science or sci-fi jargon. And given how immensely influential this show was, I can't help but believe that some of this is Haruhi's fault. Stuff like this pops up every now and again in the show, and I really don't like it. Every time I see Koizumi call for a taxi, I go into cardiac arrest because I'm about to lose 10 minutes of my life to the anthropic principle. Do you still think that Haruhi's some kind of god or something? Let me ask you this, do you know what the anthropic principle is? No, nor do I intend to. And Nagato just, oh, please stop talking. There was the possibility that your kind might provide an answer in overcoming the inert evolution the entity is experiencing. 
Throughout the universe, it is common for organic life forms to develop a consciousness. Human beings from Earth were the only creatures whose consciousness evolved into intellect. The entity carefully This scene is over three minutes long, by the way. The way I see it, there are two ways to watch these scenes. Stop thinking, maybe put yourself into a coma until it's over, or if you're feeling dangerous, actually try to pay attention. Listen intently, write everything down because it will be on the butt-fucking test, and then stop and think to yourself, wait. I'm supposed to be enjoying myself right now. I know some of the things they say are important to the story, and I'm grateful for that, but I'm far more interested in understanding why these characters behave the way they do than I am in understanding how their powers work and where they came from. Some of these scenes are really fun, like when Kion, Koizumi, and Nagato are talking about time travel. The three play off of each other really well, and the payoff is Kion lets his interest in Haruhi's next crazy scheme slip. But that's one of the only examples I could think of. As a whole, I'm not a fan of this stuff at all. And if one more show feels the need to explain to me what Schrodinger's cat is, I'm going to lose my mind. You know, thinking about how boring those scenes are really makes me believe that this show as a whole has tons of moments that are hilarious and charming. Every now and again, that signature Kyoani sense of humor peeks its head above the muddy trenches to make your day all the more enjoyable. My favorite jokes by far are the ones from the dumpster fire that was their movie. As someone who's dabbled with this whole homemade film thing once or twice, I have a really good understanding of everything that can and will go wrong as you frantically try to shamble your little passion project together. Which is why this episode is the funniest episode of any show I've ever seen. Because they went out of their way to do everything wrong. Take this part for instance. Nagato is talking while Koizumi stands in the shot with a bounce board that's accomplishing nothing until eventually the cameraman realizes his mistake and adjusts the camera in the most noisy and irritating way possible. Their entire movie is like this. I can make a separate video breaking down every single scene and explaining why it's funny. I love this piece of crap that much. That's enough, Yuki. Stop this at once. Stop talking and get on hey, with show it. Me the only thing Stop you have to do is talk. take over his mind Mad and then cat. we're done here. It's not like you haven't done something like that before, so just wave your little stick at him and... I am also a ventriloquist. And other than that, most of the humor from this show comes from its titular character Haruhi, because seeing all the crazy antics she gets up to never fails to entertain. The show likes to call her eccentric, which... Okay. Now I wouldn't put being called eccentric past myself. I mean, I still get weird looks from people if I tell them I enjoy eating at Arby's. But if my good friend took me to a cafe in order to explain to me that aliens, time travelers, and espers are real, and I naturally assumed they were pulling my leg, I would not stand up, scream at them, drink their drink, and then leave without paying my half of the bill. No, that's what an insane person would do. And yeah, it's pretty fun to watch. For example, hey Haruhi, it looks like the computer club guys aren't letting you blackmail them out of a free desktop. What are you going to do now? Then I'll tell everyone at school that all you geeks ganged up on her and f***ed her. <laughs> you out of your mind or something? Yes. Haruhi adds a lot of spice to the otherwise reserved cast of the show, and I'm very grateful for that. When I think about all the interesting, humorous scenarios the characters get themselves into in this show, it makes me think that as a whole, it's really endless eight. Yeah. To the dismay of many, including myself, it turns out whenever you expect Haruhi to do one thing, she does the complete opposite. I can only imagine the terror that welled up inside the people who watched these episodes as they aired weekly. For those who don't know, Endless 8 is a group of 8 episodes in Season 2 where the SOS Brigade finds themselves infinitely looping through the last two weeks of August, and every single episode covers the last two weeks of August, which means every single episode in Endless 8 is essentially the same episode, which is still something I have trouble processing to this day. My first thought when seeing this was, wow, this was so lazy of them, and that's just it. No, it wasn't. Because there isn't an identical frame of animation shared between any of these episodes. Even the scripts and voices were rewritten and re-recorded every single time. So, why did this happen? Well, while there's a popular theory that the disappearance arc was originally intended to be a part of season 2, it hasn't been confirmed, so we may never know why. All I know is these people sat down and put in the effort to recreate every single shot of their first episode with new angles, lighting, clothes, 
and tone seven separate times. And I really don't like it. This isn't some misunderstood artistic masterpiece or a brilliant piece of satire. It's stupid. Even the payoff, which everyone seems to praise for some reason, fell completely flat for me. I watched these episodes over a three day period and during that time I was powering through because I figured there would be a light at the end of the tunnel. The reason Haruhi had for looping Summer Break over 15,000 times would be revealed and some satisfying development would come for one of the characters. But in reality, she was looping time because she wanted to help her friends finish their summer homework because she'd never done it before. I... just... The fucking nerve of Haruhi Suzumiya. I didn't feel any relief when finishing these eight episodes, they just made me frustrated. I appreciate all the effort that went into this, but... Guys, there had to be a better way to fill episode slots. And when taking these eight circles of hell into consideration, I have to say that the school festival arc is fantastic. To the delight of many, including myself, it turns out that whenever you expect Haruhi to do one thing, she does the complete opposite. This set of episodes stands out from the rest because we get to see both the best and worst of Haruhi back to back. The worst comes when Haruhi abuses Mikuru by giving her alcohol without her knowledge and referring to her as her Toy. Kion acts out and almost hits her, which comes as a shock to everyone, especially Haruhi. Her belief was that Kion would always take her side no matter what she did, or at the very least be able to forgive her. So it was devastating to learn that not only would he do neither, but he ends up siding with the person she was demeaning so he would pay less attention to her. Her actions were unforgivable, but her thought process throughout the entire thing was completely understandable, especially taking her personality into account. This is a sign of great writing. And when you consider Koizumi's theory that Mikuru intentionally goes with Haruhi's shenanigans to draw herself closer to Kion and by extension gain more influence over Haruhi, the scenario becomes all the more interesting. But it isn't complete yet. After reconciling with Kion, Haruhi goes back to her usual self, bossing everyone around without a care in the world, and it seems as if she'll be stuck in this selfish mindset for as long as she lives. Even though I understood why, that doesn't mean it wasn't a frustrating pill to swallow. Open up! It's time for the pill! Barnacles, I hate the pill! But just as I assumed this would be the case, Kion found himself in the auditorium just as the rock club was about to perform. And his reaction somehow mirrored mine one for one as we both watched Haruhi take the stage and start playing. First thing to note, the animation. The band is playing their instruments exactly the same way someone would play these songs in real life, which is something that can only be achieved through rotoscoping. Rotoscoping is the process of taking live action footage and tracing over it, and it's even more of a pain in the ass than it sounds. This stuff takes months to do, and nobody likes doing it, but it's a necessary evil for those who are seeking the highest level of quality possible. It's how they made the lightsaber effect for the original Star Wars trilogy, and it's how we got a scene as visually impressive as this one. But what's even more impressive to me is how Haruhi behaves in this episode. The two seniors who were replaced by Haruhi and Nagato had injuries that prevented them from playing their final school festival show. Apparently Haruhi couldn't stand the thought of the songs they prepared going to waste once she saw how devastated they were, so she offered to help. And after finishing, she acted the complete opposite of how she would have acted if she put that show on herself. She was frustrated with herself for not performing as well for the band as she wanted. Embarrassed, because for the first time, she was receiving praise for doing something for someone else. And most importantly, she was happy that she was able to make them happy. A development like this would be mundane, even boring to witness for any other character. I mean, whoop de doo you've contracted good person syndrome. But the fact that it's Haruhi, of all people, is what makes it so compelling. This is easily my favorite episode of the show because of Haruhi. And speaking of which, I need to get around to talking about the show as a whole soon. I'm sure you've noticed already, but this flip-flopping game I've been playing this whole video has been my cute little way of saying I don't know where I stand with this show. And it looks like I only have one more chance to figure it out before I'm out of content to talk about. After being tossed between heaven and hell throughout the entirety of the show, all the while feeling like I was being laughed at by the creators for even taking the time to watch it, something came along at the very end that changed everything. I'm sure plenty of you are already know what it is, and it's something that only someone with the nerve of horror he would do, which is make one of the greatest films I've ever seen.
The disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya is about exactly what the title implies. On December 18th, Kiona is plunged into a world where Haruhi is gone and nobody but him remembers her or the SOS Brigade. The story follows Kiona as he tries to figure out how or if he can get back home. If being the key word here, because one of my favorite things about this film is the looming sense of hopelessness that builds over time. Disappearance is a very slow and somber movie. Two adjectives that, given my personal taste, mean I should have no business liking it as much as I do. And yet, while starting it up to get my facts straight about one scene before writing this part of the script, I ended up sitting through the entire thing from start to finish. This movie is 2 hours and 42 minutes long. I couldn't find any definitive answers for where this movie stands in terms of the longest animated films of all time, but I'm positive it's at least in the top 5. And somehow I still sat through it completely enthralled as if it wasn't my fourth time watching it. There isn't a single scene that drags on for too long, despite them all being very long, and every single one effortlessly flows into the next, making it so easy to lose track of time. It's good that it keeps your eyes glued to the screen because as expected from Kyoto Animation, this film is absolutely gorgeous, and it's scored with one of the best soundtracks I've ever had the pleasure of hearing. Every single track was performed by the eminent symphony orchestra, and their work adds a powerful emotional weight to the movie. Kyoto Animation has a wonderful habit of slipping classical music into their work, and for disappearance, Eric Satie's pieces that I won't even try to pronounce steal the show in several key scenes. But this is all technical stuff. The movie looks, sounds, and flows perfectly good for it. I'm much more interested in talking about why this film is so important to me. Do you remember when I talked about Haruhi doing the opposite of what I expected it to do? Well, Disappearance is the greatest example of this, coming in the form of two characters. We'll start with him first. Kion is the kind of character that I assumed would never crack even if the story demanded it. His constant snarky complaints, his apathetic demeanor, the way he handled himself even in the most dire of situations. All of these things nailed him in my mind as someone who just goes with the flow without a care in the world. But remove Haruhi from his life and Kion breaks down. The animators really did their best to sell the despair he's feeling in these scenes. I almost never got to see any serious emotion from the guy who calls himself the show's protagonist. The only two that come to mind are shock and anger. And yet there I was three months ago when I first watched this, staring at just another stupid kid who's scared to lose the things he takes for granted. About 40 minutes into his time in the new world, Kion has exhausted all of his options for finding something that can help him get back home. Every possible reference to the show, from the SOS Brigade members all the way down to the damn cat, has been altered to fit this new reality. And just as he's about to give up, Taniguchi mentions that he knows Haruhi. Kion gets up and starts sprinting towards where she is as the orchestra comes to life with a brilliantly triumphant piece. For the first time in almost an hour, there's hope. It's such an uplifting shock to the system after witnessing every potential solution get snuffed out, and it shows just how important the old world really is to Kion. His journey through this movie is one of self-reflection on the things that are most important to him, and in the end, he gives in to his childish sense of fun by choosing Haruhi's world as the more interesting one. I don't know about any of you, but that seems like the right choice to me. That's all well and good, but who was responsible for changing the world in the first place? Well, sticking to Haruhi's subversive traditions is the only person I didn't expect. I vividly remember watching the scene where Nagato is explaining to Kion who the villain is for the first time. I turned to my brother and tried to rationalize what I was thinking by saying this. <clears throat> Well, who the hell could it be? It isn't going to be Nagato, she's the magical fix-everything lady. Please don't be coy to me. These questions stayed in my mind only for a brief moment as Kion and adult Mikuru time travel back to the moment space-time was changed, and then I once again had all of my preconceptions shattered as none other than Yuki Nagato slowly walked up that hill. Nagato's role in the show was to be Kion's silent protector from supernatural occurrences, and as a result, both Kion and I were fooled into believing she was content with living her eternal existence, giving everything, and asking for nothing. 
nothing. Endless 8 may have been hopelessly boring for 3 hours worth of content, and I admit I complained about it the entire way through, but Nagato had it worse than me for give or take 595 years. When I look at the facial expressions this supposedly emotionless alien made in the small snippet that I saw of this hellish experience, I feel stupid for not realizing she was suffering sooner. Even if you weren't made to feel anything, anyone would want to scream at Haruhi for everything she did. Call her selfish, an idiot, whatever you find most appropriate. And luckily, Kion figured this out too. The rooftop scene that closes out the film shows the first time Nagato is treated like she's a human, and more than that, a friend. When Nagato tells Kion that her superiors are going to punish her for changing the world, Kion fires back with a threat by saying if anything ever happens to her, he'll tell Haruhi everything and go get her back. And to prove how serious he is about treating her like she matters from now on, he gives her his coat. She doesn't need it never has. She probably can't even feel temperatures unless they're as hot as a blue star or as cold as space. But in this fleeting instance, it's the gesture that matters more than anything. And once the movie ends on a happy note as Kion enters the club room with a renewed sense of joy, the audience is left with the credits. No visuals, just a black screen as Nagato's voice actress sings without any music behind it, to remind the audience that while the story has come to a satisfying end, something, and a handful of of some ones were lost along the way. Despite the happiness that Kion has, there's still consequence. Despite Nagato being accepted for the feelings she now has, her wish to live in a normal world without any special powers is buried forever. I know I just rambled on for way too long there, but in all honesty, I could talk about this movie for forever if I wanted to. It's a good thing that editing is such a pain then. Alright, now I think I'm finally ready to answer that question, so go ahead and ask. If you don't mind, I'd like to return to the movie one last time, because there's one scene that I feel ties up this whole thing nicely, and it's the scene where Kion makes his final choice about which universe he prefers. His intrapersonal monologue takes the form of an argument with himself as he questions how he really feels about Haruhi's shenanigans. Turns out his answer was the same as mine. It's annoying, it's obnoxious, and I'm sick of it. Yet here we both are doing things that directly contradict what we just said. It's uncanny just how much Kion's feelings mirrored mine as I watched the show. There are several instances where just as I was thinking something, Kion monologued the exact same sentiment to himself. It's almost as if Kyo and Andy knew exactly how their audience would react to what they put in front of them, and went along with it knowing the majority would end up reaching the same conclusion Kion did about Haruhi. And, well, it definitely worked on me. Because despite everything, I have a tremendous amount of fun whenever I revisit Haruhi. It's one of the most unique experiences I've ever had watching a show. That's because no one can ever replicate it. That doesn't mean nobody's tried. This show was so unapologetically popular in the mid-2000s that it caused a boom of slice-of-life shows trying to ride its coattails. But you can't recapture lightning in a bottle. It's so weird, charming, interesting, stupid, and wonderful all at the same time. So to answer your question, yes, I adore this show. I mean, think about it for a sec. Aliens, time travelers, and Esper's man? One's enough. But no, I got to watch all three. And then there's Haruhi, who's got the craziest power of them all. And then there's all these other mysterious powers sprinkled all over the place. How could I not find all this stuff fun, huh? Ask me as many times as you want, and my answer won't change. Of course I do.